Marcel Petio was a French doctor and serial killer who was suspected of killing around 60 people during World War II. Marcel took advantage of desperate people for his own benefit and had a complete disregard for human life. Most of his victims simply vanished and became a statistic in the death toll of war, but his luck eventually ran out, and his head would be the price for his crimes. Discretion is advised. This is 10-Minute Murder. Welcome to 10-Minute Murder, brief and bingeable true crime. I'm the host. My name is Joe. Hi. I appreciate you. Uh, I appreciate you existing as a person, uh, but I appreciate you existing as a person while listening to my little podcast right now. I've been asked before how often I mess up at the beginning of an episode and just completely start over. Well, this one should be a shining example that doesn't happen very often. I can usually talk my way out of mistakes and what I meant to say or plan to say. Like, let me go to my notes here where it has written what I'm supposed to say. It says, talk about how you don't speak French and the episode today is dripping with French. That's the one thing that I do have to edit and repeat and stress over. It's how to pronounce names and cities that I'm not familiar with. I've taken Spanish courses and a little bit of German, but French looked way too hard, so I didn't mess around with it. So please keep that in mind today as I absolutely destroy that language. I'm going to do my best. But before it starts, let me ask you to subscribe to 10 Minute Murder so that my mom will be proud of me and you don't miss any future episodes. Connect with the podcast on social media. That's where you'll find all the visuals that go along with the episodes that you're hearing, including the one today for Dr. Satan. Picture a silent film star from the 1920s playing an evil character with the crazy eyes and a sinister looking smile. And that's exactly what he looked like. I say looked because, spoiler alert, he's dead now. Obviously because he was born in the 1800s. Okay, let's just get into the whole story. Marcel Petiot was born on January 17, 1897, in Yonne, France. Marcel was pretty clever, but he got into trouble at a young age. His first run-in with the law happened in his teen years after he robbed a post box and was charged with damage of public property and theft. Because of that, he had to have a psychiatric evaluation. Those charges ended up being dropped when the psychiatrist found that Marcel had a mental illness. Lots of different stories about things that happened in Marcel's childhood, different things that he was involved in, Uh, They popped up after his later crimes hit the headlines, but a lot of those were probably just fabricated. Regardless of that, a different psychiatrist again confirmed Marcel's mental illness in March of 1914 when he was 17 years old. He had been expelled from school so many times that he ended up finishing his high school education at a special academy in Paris in July 1915. Even though he had been diagnosed with mental health problems, Marcel volunteered for the French Army in World War I, in January 1916. It shouldn't come as a surprise that this time didn't do him any favors. He was wounded and gassed during the Second Battle of Asni. I'm probably not saying that right. Uh, But Marcel was sent home after that, and he started to show the signs of an impending breakdown. From there, he bounced around from rest homes, but ended up being arrested for stealing. Again, the list of things was long. Blankets, morphine, wallets, letters, photographs, and various army supplies. Unsurprisingly, this didn't go unpunished, and Marcel was jailed in Orleans. He again was put into a psychiatric hospital and again diagnosed with mental illness. But he was still sent back to the front lines in June 1918. Three weeks after being sent back, he injured his own foot with a grenade and was transferred to a new regiment. In around September of that year, he finally got a diagnosis that got him discharged from service and he was put onto a disability pension. But Marcel, the man with multiple mental illness diagnoses, didn't just live out his days on his disability pension. He wanted to do something more, so he joined the accelerated education program that was geared toward war veterans. Marcel managed to finish medical school in eight months and started working as an intern at a mental hospital. He got his medical degree in December 1921 and earned a living from treating patients and getting government medical assistance funds. Do you remember when I mentioned morphine earlier as one of the things that Marcel stole from the rest homes? Well, at this point in his life, he was on a steady supply of addictive narcotics and quickly became known 
as a rather dubious character in the medical community. Marcel gave his patients narcotics, performed illegal abortions, and continued to steal even though he was making a decent income. In 1926, Marcel ran for mayor of his local town but didn't want to try to win it fair and square. Instead, during the political debate with his opponent, he hired someone to disrupt the whole thing. This worked, and he won. He ran his office how he had run his medical practice. Poorly. Marcel embezzled town funds, which didn't go unnoticed for long. In the meantime, Marcel married Georgette Lablias, the 23-year-old daughter of a wealthy landowner and butcher. They had a son in April 1928 and named him Gerdhardt. After the complaints started rolling in about Marcel's dodgy deals, he ended up being suspended as mayor in August 1931, so he just resigned. Marcel was clearly quite the charmer, though, because the entire village council resigned also following his resignation. A little more than a month after, he was elected as Councillor of Yon Department. He didn't clean up his act, and after being accused of stealing electricity in 1932, Marcel lost his council seat. But at this stage, he had already moved to Paris. Once in Paris, Marcel forged credentials to get new patients and built up a decent reputation for his practice, until the rumors started again of his illegal abortions and narcotics prescriptions. In 1936, he was appointed to a level of medicine and gave him the authority to write death certificates. 1936 was also the year in which he was institutionalized briefly for kleptomania. There was also some tax evasion floating around in there somewhere. In 1940, when Germany defeated France in World War II, French citizens were made to do forced labor in Germany. Marcel helped some people avoid this by writing up fake medical disability certificates for them. In July 1942, he was convicted of over-prescribing narcotics, despite two addicts who were set to testify against him having disappeared. And I'll give you one good guess who was responsible for that. For this, Marcel was fined 2,400 francs. He then went on to tell people about his supposed resistance activities. He claimed to have created secret weapons that killed Germans without leaving any forensic evidence. He also said he put booby traps all over Paris and had meetings with Allied commanders and worked with a group of Spanish anti-fascists, but this supposed group didn't actually exist. At this point in the story, you're probably thinking, hey Joe, when are you going to talk about the 60 people he murdered? Well, right about now. Marcel's big moneymaker during Germany's control of France was a false escape network. He took on the name of Dr. Eugene and made people believe that he could get them out of France to either Argentina or elsewhere in South America for a mere 25,000 francs. He had three men working with him who could find people and direct them to Dr. Eugene. They consisted mainly of Jews and resistance fighters with the occasional criminal thrown in here and there. Once Dr. Eugene had his victim, he would convince them that the Argentine officials needed all entrants to be inoculated against disease. Of course, having come this far and paid 25,000 francs, people would agree and Dr. Eugene would inject them with cyanide. And I don't know how much you know about cyanide, but that's not what it's for. Once the victim had died, he would take all of their valuables and get rid of their bodies. He was killing and robbing people. At the start of this operation, he would dump bodies in a river, but he graduated to submerging them in quicklime or incinerating them. He bought himself a house in 1941 and masterminded his operation out of there from that point on. Marcel's Dr. Eugene gig wasn't going unnoticed, and the Gestapo soon found out about him. If you don't know the name, the Gestapo was the official secret police for Nazi Germany, basically a group of people who you would rather not be on the radar of. By 1943, they had learned of his escape route for wanted people, which they obviously assumed was part of the resistance, not some crazy guy's get-rich-quick scheme. In order to get a better idea of how this whole thing was working, a Gestapo agent sent a prisoner to approach the network. Unsurprisingly, that man just disappeared. Later on, an informant did manage to infiltrate the operation and Marcel's three accomplices were arrested. With a bit of torture, they spilled the beans about Dr. Eugene and revealed him to be Marcel Petio. On March 11, 1944, Marcel's neighbors complained about a bad smell and a ton of smoke coming from his chimney. Police were worried about a possible chimney fire, so firemen were brought in to look through the house. Once they entered, a massive fire was found in the basement's coal stove, and in that fire were human remains. After looking through his home, police found remains in a quicklime pit, in the backyard as well, and in some canvas bags. Ten victims' worth of body parts were also discovered. 
His house was littered with suitcases and clothing of all sorts of things that had belonged to his victims. The media caught a whiff of this news and it quickly spread across Europe. He was dubbed Dr. Satan. Marcel actually wasn't captured for seven whole months after this discovery. He hid out with some friends and told them that the Gestapo wanted him since he'd killed Germans and informers. Paris was liberated in 1944, and with this, Marcel took on a new name, Henry Valéry. He joined the French forces of the interior in the uprising and became involved in counter-espionage and prisoner interrogations, because Marcel apparently doesn't understand the concept of lying low. A newspaper published an article about Marcel, and he just couldn't help himself but contact his previous defense lawyers, saying that the allegations were all lies. This renewed the police's search for Marcel. His days on the run came to an end on October 31st when he was arrested at a Paris metro station. Marcel was imprisoned at La Sante prison and maintained that he was innocent of the crimes and had only killed enemies of France. He claimed to have discovered the pile of bodies at his home in 1944 and he assumed that they were informers killed by the resistance network. Police checked up on this and quickly learned that Marcel had no friends in any of the actual resistance groups and some of the ones he had mentioned didn't even exist. Prosecutors went on to charge him with 27 murders for profit. His estimated monetary gain was 200 million francs. Marcel Petio went on trial on March 19, 1946. He was facing a wall of 135 criminal charges. Despite his and his defense team's attempts to convince the court that Marcel's victims had either been double agents or were in fact living in South America, he ended up being convicted of 26 murders and sentenced to death. Marcel was beheaded on May 25, 1946, finally bringing an end to his reign of terror. Dr. Satan was buried at Ivory Cemetery. That's 10-Minute Murder for today. Brief and bingeable true crime. Thanks for being a part of it, and like I mentioned at the beginning of this episode, in the show notes of this episode, you will find links to where you can connect with 10-Minute Murder on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, all the places. Um, you can subscribe to 10-Minute Murder or follow 10-Minute Murder. Uh, and on many of those, like Facebook and Instagram, you'll see photos that go along with the episodes that you're hearing about. The show notes is where you'll find all that information. And before you go today, if you are not subscribed to 10-Minute Murder, First of all, you're breaking my heart. I don't know why you're doing this to me. But make sure you subscribe so that you don't miss any future episodes of 10-Minute Murder. And finally, if you have friends and you think they might be into brief true crime stories like the one that you heard today, let them know about 10-Minute Murder. Thanks for listening. Be safe and have a good night.